Welcome to the first episode of the Flow Protocols podcast. My name is Kat Howell and I'm going to be your host on this warpy rabbit hole journey. We are all about exploring how to redefine the rules of business, how to create surpluses without sacrifice, how to turn play into profit, all spurred down by my own experiences trying to maintain my sanity, if you will, amongst growing a multi-million dollar, highly successful company, and yet finding myself at the peak of the mountain, deeply depressed and unfulfilled. What gives, right? And this is so prolific in the entrepreneurial world these days. Manic, exhausting, chasing, overwhelm, burnout, sacrifice. So this podcast is aimed at getting rid of that, I guess. Removing those ideas and those beliefs and those structures that require us to sacrifice mental, psychological, time, equity in exchange for well-being. It's all about making our well-being unconditional. On this episode, I want to discuss worthiness. This is a discussion that I had yesterday with a good friend of mine and somebody who's actually in the Flow Protocols program right at this moment. And she's in the early stages of basically trying to get herself out of depression, becoming aware that that is what she was experiencing or she is experiencing and working towards understanding and gaining the awareness of what that emotion is trying to communicate with her, what she needs to do in her life to essentially feel well again, right? Now, depression is a sensation of hopelessness. It's a sensation of loneliness. It's a sensation of worthlessness. And sometimes it's all of those combined at once. It's a complete disconnection from love. It couldn't be further away from love. It's the basically the same thing, but the total opposite side of the spectrum. And it's a heavy emotion to live with. It's exhausting. It drains the body. It feels like you've you just you have no energy to do anything. And really you can't be asked anyways. It feels so hopeless. And this is an emotion I'm very familiar with myself. I first experienced depression at the age of eight. I had my first suicide attempt not long after that. Uh, FYI, boom boxes and bathtubs don't always do it. So don't try that at home, kids. And throughout my teenage years, I experienced depression as well. And I sort of went a 12-year gap somewhere in my 20s where I didn't have it. And I really pinged that down to the flow states I found myself in when I was building my business, when I was studying, when I was establishing roots in a new country, I had fallen in love. So I went through a moment in my life where I didn't have this thing. And then at the peak of everything, I found myself experiencing this darkness again and I couldn't understand for the life of me why I was experiencing those dark thoughts why they were getting progressively worse I I tried everything to solve for this and the the thing is I think what I've come to realize is that when you're experiencing depression or any form of really high tension emotion like anxiety you really you're 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 zoomed in way too much and you can't see the broader picture it's like your focus has like zoomed in on something and you're missing the bigger picture and it's kind of like when someone falls in love you can give them all the best advice in the world but they're going to ignore you they have blinders on and so Love, you know, it's the simplest thing, but the hardest thing, because when you're in it, you don't really see it as clearly as you do with the hindsight of time, right? (laughs) And so here I was trying to solve for this thing 
that was sort of really weighing heavy in my life and it was beginning to affect my business. The revenues were plateauing and I was going to therapy and I tried all sorts of modalities. I astrology, Reiki, sensory deprivation tanks, all of that stuff. I flew all over the world. I went to retreats. I hired mindset coaches So it wasn't for lack of trying either, but what I couldn't see that is so obvious now was that I had never really established a sense of self-worth without certain things behind me or in place. And so when I found myself feeling unfulfilled in my business and trapped by the money and trapped by this thing that I had created, I was really forgetting myself in that moment, right? I was disconnecting from from love. And, uh, and the longer I stayed in that situation, the more I forgot myself, the deeper the depression got, the more it advanced, the the harder it felt to deal with and the darker it got. So in that moment, it was difficult for me to see it. And it took for me, unfortunately, to really hit rock bottom with it. So there was like four suicide attempts in there. And it was really on the last one that I realized like, fuck, I think I actually do want to live. I think there's a part of me that's deeply confused and I'm so fucking tired like I couldn't imagine going on another moment in that state it was just exhausting as much as I had no idea how to get myself out of it I just knew I had to turn things around and it was sort of like a penny dropping moment for me there's honestly this like there's nothing like a rock bottom right to spur these kinds of aha moments where you finally see the blind spots that was causing the tension all along it doesn't have to get to that point though that's the thing like I didn't understand worthiness and my emotions in the way that I do now And the way that I handle emotions, like, it's not about never having depression or about trying to isolate ourselves or incubate ourselves from ever feeling fear or boredom or anger. Actually, it's the opposite of that. Those emotions are very healthy and they're very important for your own growth and development because... You're always going to encounter fear if you're growing, right? You're always going to encounter a boundary that is going to make you have doubts and insecurities and fears, and it's about pushing past that. It's about understanding what those fears are really communicating to you in that whatever you are thinking in that moment is incorrect. It's not the correct perspective. But I didn't see it that way. I was a, I was basically a, a victim of my, my, my chemistry, my hormones, my genes, my traumas of the past, my experiences. And it felt like this thing that I was just going to have to live with for the rest of my life. And that's really depressing. You feel so stuck, but it's an illusion. It's absolutely not true. Actually, life does get better. It does get better. But the thing is, when you've been manic chasing, because it's all been your well-being has always been conditional on the money or the success or the accolades or the lover or the family or whatever it is that that you basically plug up when when this happens, then I will feel this when I don't have so many invoices, then I will feel relaxed. When my team does the work they're supposed to do, then I will be able to do the things and play the way I want to play. When my bank account does this, when my business does this, when clients do this, right? Whenever there's a when then in your life, there's always a condition. That's a condition. That's what you call a condition. When this happens, then I will feel well. Or I will be able to 
appreciate this experience of life for what it is, right? And man, when you live with conditions, like try that on for size. Most of us have, right? That's where I was at in my life. It doesn't work. <laughs> it always catches up with you, no matter what you try to do or where you run to. You can't escape that shit. So unfortunately for me, it was the rock bottom, but now I know how to veer myself away from that. I know how to appreciate those emotions when they come to me and how to ride the wave of them without suffering in it, right? And making it something that it doesn't need to be. It's uh, the, the greatest irony is it's actually very simple. But the hardest thing is that you are going to be susceptible to your own blinders when you're in it. And you're going to be talking yourself out of this shit. It's crazy what your mind will come up with when you're operating over prolonged periods of time in an anxious or depressed or overwhelmed state, right? Even anger and frustration or boredom. So for me, the depression was really an understanding that I was just getting reflected back from life what I was putting in and I had like zoomed in my focus on something about myself or reality that made me feel really cynical about everything else like it was all hopeless and so I had to sort of extrovert my focus intentionally and I had to extrovert it back to states of appreciation, love, right? The mere emotion of depression. So, so my friend yesterday was saying to me what was interesting. She was, it was like she was talking about, so if we can place like worthiness, right, in our bodies, if we can, if we can get ourselves into a state of appreciation and gratitude it is a remedy for depression. It is, it is, but you do have to integrate it, right? That's the key. And it's so simple, it's so easy to brush this stuff away and to deprioritize it. But there's, like, make no mistake, there's nothing more important than your well being. Everything in your reality is tainted by your well being. And it impacts those people around you as well, right? When you're operating in anger or frustration, guess what? Everybody around you like feels triggered and in tension. It's a rippling effect, right? When you're depressed, you don't really show up properly for people around you or for, for yourself alone, right? So, so, so it's almost more selfish to not be selfish in that way because when you're not selfish in this way where you're not prioritizing your well-being above and beyond anything else it does like it, it's just a mirror it doesn't matter what you do you're going to be fighting your reflection at that time and then yeah it feels really fucking hopeless because that is hopeless that's stupid right you have to change the 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 mirror the reality it has to be an internal shift and your depression is really telling you that you've completely disconnected love somewhere like there's something in your life that is making you really not like yourself you're completely out of step with your own relationship with yourself right so this is an invitation for once in our life if we've never ever intentionally taught ourselves the skill of like dating ourselves and getting in step with ourselves and becoming like really great friends with each other with ourselves <laughs> right what a beautiful skill to teach yourself isn't it common sense that we should be teaching every single person this because we've just established it's selfish not to do that, right? It's detrimental to the, the tribe, to all of us. So the way she was talking about this goalpost of understanding that it was, you know, for her, for the first time in her life, she has to teach herself how to feel worthy, unconditional of what the fuck other people and things around her are doing. 
to just appreciate her as she is with all her flaws, nothing added, nothing missing. What a, what a difficult task for most of us to do. It sounds simple, but here's the truth. If I asked you to name me 10 beautiful qualities about yourself, it would be way harder for you to list those than if I asked you what isn't working for you in your life right now. Hands fucking down. You'll spit one of those out in 10 seconds and the other one will take you 10 minutes. There's something twisted about that. So getting to feel her sense of self-worth and teaching her this. And it's understandable that she didn't have that to begin with. Like most of us were raised by deeply traumatized people passing on cycles of abuse. And abuse includes, by the way, like miseducation, financial miseducation, because that keeps people feeling really fucking emotionally, psychologically trapped for a great part of their lives, right? So it's understandable that we, we have these complexes that we do about our self-worth. Sure, it makes sense, but it doesn't excuse the fact that, okay, we can start now. We can start now. We have awareness now, and now we can actually take action with this awareness, right? And nothing in the past ever predetermines your ability to be able to do that, I'd say, with the exception that you've had a lobotomy, right? It might be like quite hard at that stage. But you're listening to this podcast, so I'm assuming you're all in possession of a human mind, a human imagination. It's the most powerful thing on this planet. It is what has allowed us to connect virtually in this way with like a signal going up in space and bounce. I don't even know how it works. It's magic, right? We're creating that. Our minds. Our minds are really, really powerful. And when they're zoomed in, on something that makes us feel bad and we uh, aren't listening to ourselves, then they can turn against us. They are very, very powerful. Our minds are very powerful, right? But this idea that a sense of worthiness is like this mountaintop that is so difficult to conquer and achieve, I think is the thing that people really struggle with and it discourages a lot of people because we have this idea of self-worth as this peak that is so difficult to conquer and if it was, you know, you'd have it already and you're like in your mid-30s or whatever by now or whatever why don't you know, why don't you have self-worth, right? If it was so easy, more of us would have it. But it's actually not something up on a pedestal at all. And in fact, the easiest way to think about it is really like trying to learn the splits. Like the splits is not, sure, you might revere people that can do the splits because you can't. But if you intentionally applied yourself to a split, you actually could, and all body shapes and sizes can do the splits. That's the coolest thing, right? Just like all human minds can refocus themselves on things that inspire worthiness, right? And well-being. So... It's not something on a pedestal that's like super difficult to obtain. Maybe, though, it will take a bit of practice. Maybe, though, if you try to do it in one go right away, you might rip some shit, right? So it's better if it takes a few goes, a few stretches. It's better if you ease yourself into it, right? Because a 180 would be like such a quantum leap. You, something, somebody is getting hit by a bus somewhere, right? <laughs> So, so it's a stretch. That's all it is. And, and when you're stretching, when you're learning to do the splits and you don't get it the second go around or the third go, you don't just go like, oh, I can't do the splits. No, because you understand you incrementally, you're probably not noticing the difference, right? You probably don't know it day to day. You probably can't see it. But when you compare it from day one to day 30 or 60 or, you know, six months down, whatever it takes you, there's a big difference. There's the splits there at the end. So it's the same thing. 
and you can tap into worthiness like that. Like there's so many things that can inspire a sense of worthiness, of awe. Awe has the ability to inspire worthiness in the body. So when I was deeply depressed, the things that I would do is I would take myself to the observatory or under a night sky. Like I would intentionally go out hiking and you don't have to like hiking to do this. You can just go find an observatory, which I did when I was in the city and I would just sit there and it would give me perspective and it was just enough perspective to create a stretch, like just stretching. It didn't like suddenly cure my depression, no, but it was a stretch and cumulatively, well, that was a big word. <laughs> All of those stretches added up, added up to the splits, added up to me being able to inspire a sense of confidence and worthiness in myself, to find myself. And the, the, it was like, I love the analogy of the splits because it literally took me two months once I, once I became intentional in this way. So other things for me when I was deeply depressed that inspired worthiness or awe was nature. Obviously that one is pretty freaking universal, which is good news for you. It's like scientifically shown that just 15 minutes around a tree or some green stuff is will like soothe your parasympathetic nervous system so go do that intentionally like just find things even if you're really struggling to find anything good right now in your life there's some things around you small things small little universes all around you go pet a freaking dog if you have to go make friends with a dog Usually dogs are pretty good at inspiring a sense of self-worth, right? And so we don't have to like put this big thing on this pedestal where when I feel worthy, then I'll have a great life and things will finally feel better and I'll get over the depression and all this shit that's happening. First of all, we don't want to like not experience the emotions in our lives. That's not the point. There's something beautiful in the depression once you begin to understand what it's trying to communicate with you, which is that, hey, we're making our well-being conditional. We don't fucking know how to give ourselves love right now. What a beautiful invitation that emotion is to an expansion of yourself, right? And so they're really sort of paving the yellow brick road for you. It's not about like isolating ourselves for forever in them, but it's certainly about not suffering in them the way that we do or the way that we, we have done in the past. And it just starts by understanding that, okay, there's conditions I'm creating right now around how I'm going to feel well. When this happens or these people behave this way or this situation isn't the way that it is right now, I would actually feel really comfortable and at ease and enjoying life. But reality is the mirror of you, my friend. So that like right away, that rationality, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. And I'm not going to go into mirroring in depth in this podcast, but I have a free masterclass that really goes deep in that at the theflowprotocols.com. So go check that out there. But we can't we we can't even honor that perspective. We can understand why we came to believe things were the way that they were. But it's just a mirror of us. So we need to listen to what those mirrors are saying to us and usually, always, an invitation to find our own hand, to find a sense of well-being, to remove the, those conditions, to remember ourselves. And the kind of cool thing about depression and why I believe it's so prolific amongst entrepreneurs is that Entrepreneurs are very creative individuals. Just the way the entrepreneurial mind works, just fast thinkers, churn and burn, lots of ideas, and usually deeply creative, deeply, deeply creative, right? 
And the mirror of emotion of depression is love, right? Which is like the highest emotion. A lot of philosophers and, and even religions out there believe that love is the energy that created everything, is the universal force of this, this whatever this thing is that we're, we're living, embodying in. So when you're feeling depressed, the expansion on the back of that is usually a really big, powerful one. And there's so much creativity that occurs in that state because it's a deep cryolysis. It's a transformation. It's really like the emotions going like, here's the yellow brick road, follow, 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 follow. And it gets progressively worse and worse and deeper and more intense until you start to listen, right? But it's difficult when you're in it. It's difficult when you're in it and that has to be acknowledged. And so I would say that if you are finding yourself in a deeply depressed or a highly anxious state, a great place to start is to find people around you that you can connect with and be open about this. And I know that when I was going through it, I thought in my mind I didn't want to be a burden to people. I didn't want people to feel like I was just complaining and this negative Betty. And also I had, you know, this online persona that I had to like put up a face. It felt like I had to do that, right, at the time. So that, that if that's what you're thinking and rationalizing right now, I just want to let you know that is so deeply incorrect. People thrive being able to support each other like our tribe our tribal connections we get the greatest sense of meaning and fulfillment from we're deeply social creatures we just want to support each other and help each other in this way right and there's always going to be somebody that will help you even a stranger will help you so my biggest advice if you're in a really bad place right now and you're thinking some really dark thoughts Reach out to somebody as soon as you can. It will tremendously help to lift some of the heaviness off your shoulders, right? And remember, depression is the opposite of love, of appreciation. Okay, you might not be able to fully love yourself today. We get it. There's a lot of things that have led up to this point. But there are many things in your life where you can go into thoughts or imagining or activities where you can place a sense of love, which is the same as gratitude, which is the same as appreciation, which is the same as awe, right? Which is the same as worthiness. So anything that makes you feel awe or grateful or appreciative or do that like do a lot of that shift your entire schedule your entire calendar where you are prioritizing that and watch what happens it will be a very quick transformation because it's that if you use your mind to intentionally place yourself in things that feel well that is unconditional (laughs) well-being (laughs) right? You didn't need anything else except yourself. You didn't need your mind as you. You didn't need anything else, right? But to be clear, you are not your mind, but you possess the mind. Therefore, that is unconditional well-being. And it doesn't have to be this quantum leap of like, oh, I need to suddenly love myself and feel so worthy when you're so depressed, just start small, but just intentionally prioritize those things and f- and be really honest with yourself. Like what makes you feel well and and happy and and converse with yourself why you're telling yourself you can't have those things like really bring that out to light what are you really saying to yourself as the reasons you can't have that because the truth is that's what the depression is communicating that you're wrong whatever you're saying there is incorrect and you're subscribing yourself to an rss feed 
that hasn't been updated since 2017 and your emotions are like, here's the yellow brick road to get to the updated installed software. You just got to you just got to let this idea go that you can't have that. Right. Um, and it's sometimes hard to see it. It takes some effort, but you can dislodge that by just going into activities that put that sensation of love. Love is the remedy to depression. So if you are finding yourself there, my friend, I'm sending you some really good thoughts, really good vibes. I want you to know it gets so good on the other side. And there is another side. Your emotions are serving you. There's nothing there. There's nothing that is punishing you right now. OK, let that be very, very clear. You have the power and the capacity to turn this around and you will discover that it's never about getting rid of these emotions or being afraid of fear or afraid of these things happening to us. It's about learning that those emotions are basically beautiful communication tools that we have with ourselves. And when we learn how to listen to ourselves in this way, we experience life on a very different level. It's kind of trippy. It's kind of some warpy Kool-Aid shit. So I hope you enjoyed the first episode of the Flow Protocols. I feel like I'm going to have to sneeze soon, so I'm going to wrap this up. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe. Share it with somebody that you feel needs to hear this. If that feels aligned to you, that would be really appreciated. Thank you so much, and I will see you guys on the next episode.